happy, happy to be here together for this high holiday town hall. So we want to open up this evening's conversation with a um, with a song, with a taste of some of the high holiday music to, to launch us into this conversation. We're going to mute our the other participants. And if you recognize the song, um, please feel free to join us from home. <laughs> say quickly it's great to be here um i'm gonna go and uh see to the crying child <laughs> but i may rejoin the group probably from another computer later but it's so exciting to be part of the bzbi community for the high holidays again hopefully the high holiday season will have fewer tears than the first few minutes of this uh of this program <laughs> 
Um, so we wanted to start out with that song, the words, Hashiveni ve'ashuva, help me to return to you, God, and I will return, renew our days as they once were. And these are words that come from the prophet Jeremiah. They're words that we find at the end of the book of Echa, the book of Lamentations. And they are words that launch us in to the season of the High Holidays, a time for finding a way back to what is essential, finding our way back to our best selves, back to God, back to one another. And what an intense and uncertain and full and strange and unprecedented year this has has been for us and we're cycling back soon into the high holiday season into liturgy into words of torah into rituals that have have brought comfort have brought continuity to our people for generations and we know that as our people have lived through difficult times um the traditions have, have been there and to hold us. We've been there to hold one another. And the traditions have, have evolved in, in different ways. So we are here on this evening coming together to think about the high holidays and how this year we can make them uh, full of, of meaning for, for each one of us, full of, of connections. We're grateful to all of you for, for being here. I um, wanted to offer a little bit of music, uh, some words of Torah to start us off. I'm going to um, turn things over now to Sheila Siegel, who, along with Elkin Siegel, are, are co-chairing our High Holiday Task Force um, to, to welcome our, our community. Oh. Beth, for the beautiful words and music of Torah uh, for beginning our, our town hall by turning our, our spirits um, toward the Yamin Narayim um, in the way that only you and Yosef can do. <laughs> so thank you for that. And hi, everybody. I'm Sheila Siegel, and it's my, uh, my privilege, my pleasure to co-chair the task force on the uh, Yamin Narayim uh, with Elkin Siegel. Um, and uh, I want to also um, tell you who else is participating in the task force. We have a you know, wonderful representation of our congregation. Um, Ginny Green, Robin Lebo, Terry Soifer, Beth Garskowitz, Sarah Kahn, Ivy Weingram, Brian Wasserman, and Oren Pollock. Uh, along, of course, uh, of course, along with um, Rabbi Annie, Rabbi Abe, and Rabbi Yosef. Um, so our, our purpose as a task force is to support the clergy and to represent the congregation, the kahal, as we look towards a season of, of high holy days, um, high holy day services unlike any we've experienced before. Uh, and we've been experiencing a, a lot of new things in, in the past several months. Um, and it's, it's uh, I think, important for us to, as, as we look towards the high, high holidays, just to take a moment to note how our congregation has already been able to adapt to this new situation and to, um, to tr sort of transform our, our valued community experiences into this new um, Zoom reality. Um, we've had start services and study sessions, discussions, meetings, even life cycle events and um, uh, observances, celebrations. Um, and all of this has required adapting and reimagining how we do things. Um, so we've done that and we're gonna bring that same openness and that same spirit to our visioning and planning for the high holidays. Our main goal tonight in having this meeting is to welcome everyone into this process. Um, so here's how we're, we're going to proceed this evening. We'll begin with a report by Rabbi Abe, uh, who will get all of us up to speed on the overall plan um, the p and explain the pieces that are in place, um, logistics, safety concerns, um, all of those um, important
important basic things uh, that we have to know. Um, earlier this week, our task force met for the first time. And um, after Abe gives his uh, presentation, we're going to share with you uh, what emerged from our discussion um, of the, the values and the goals um, that the, the task force group feels are important um, uh, for us to keep in mind in, in uh, creating our high holiday services and making them meaningful to us. Um, so we'll share uh, those um, that brainstorming with you and invite you into that. Uh, and then most important, we'll have an open discussion uh, so that you can not only bring your questions and share your concerns, but also share you know, with us your priorities um, and your hopes for services this year, um, what you feel is really most important to, to, um, to make these services meaningful and um, inspiring. And finally, Rabbi Annie will, will sum up what you tell us is important to you and look towards weaving it all into beautiful, meaningful services. So we turn to you, Rabbi Abe. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and I wanna uh, just thank everyone for making the time to be here tonight. Uh, many of you know that BZBI's path to online Shabbat services was a slow and very deliberate path. Um, and much of what we were doing in the gap between uh, needing to close the synagogue because of health concerns and opening our online Shabbat services in June was about listening to the community uh, and for Rabbi Annie and I and the ritual committee to really understand what mattered most to BZBI uh, so that we could, to the best of our ability and within the uh, constraints of technology, offer an online Shabbat service that would meet the actual specific needs of our community. Um, and, uh, you know, as I've heard from a number of you who have been to online Zoom services elsewhere, um, we do things differently at BZBI. Um, which is no surprise because when people were going to services in physical synagogues, we would hear from people that we do things differently at BCPI. Um, so our goal for tonight really is to hear uh, reflections, ideas, concerns, hopes from members of the community. Um, so that as the High Holiday Task Force meets over the course of this summer to really put some shape and definition on the outline that I'm about to give, um, that we will be working toward what our community wants. Um, and, you know, if what some of you are going to say, well, what I want is to be in synagogue, then what our community wants as a second best option. Um, because the reality is I'd rather be there with everybody too if it were safe to do so. And that's really the starting point, uh, which is as we have moved closer and closer to this green phase or modified green phase, unmodified green, whatever it turns out to be, uh, Rabbi Annie and I, uh, in consultation with a number of physicians who are members of the congregation, have been asking ourselves the question of, well, what would it look like to take the guidelines around public worship that are in the, the city of Philadelphia guidelines, the CDC guidelines, um, which were of course written by people who don't have a particular building or a particular sanctuary or a particular style of service in mind. What would it look like to take all of those things and actually apply them to BZBI, to our building? to our community, to the way that we have historically run services for the high holidays. Um, and it became very clear pretty early on that it was not going to be feasible in a safe way mm -hmm. to have an in-person high holiday service. Um, and we wrestled with some of these questions. You know, would we do a ticket lottery and say, look, if we have space for 100 people, how many people want to come, you know, put in for tickets and we'll raffle them off. Um, and our concern with that was that 
it's much more difficult to deliver a hybrid experience than to deliver one experience. And if we're all going to be there, fine. If we're all going to be interfacing with this service by a computer, fine. If we're trying to put 100 people in the room and 400 people on the computer, um, that starts to become a very difficult and complicated proposition. And this is something that's not unique to services. I have a, a brother-in-law who's a professor at a university and, and he's struggling with this right now with recognizing that about half of his students next year are gonna be on campus and half of his students are gonna be connecting via computer from somewhere. And he's, he's tearing his hair out thinking, how am I gonna to teach to two different audiences differently? Um, and it's the same thing, right? We're learning how to run an active and engaging service online. We have learned and continue to improve at running engaging services in person. Um, but we reached the conclusion that what was going to provide the entire community with the optimal experience was going to be to offer an online high holiday service for everyone. Um, and so that is the paradigm that we're moving forward with. Uh, at the moment, it looks like it will be possible for us to have uh, what, I've, what I've taken to referring to as a skeleton minion, a skeleton crew at the synagogue, um, the bare dozen people that we would need to run the service. Um, and that's gonna let us run a very different kind of online service than we've been running for Shabbat, uh, because unlike Shabbat, where we've been saying Kaddish, but otherwise avoiding Devarim, Shabbat, Kedusha, and other things that require the physical presence of a minion, um, as we've received the halachic guidance from the rabbinical assembly, once we have a minion constituted in person in the sanctuary, we can then include the Zoom gallery in that minion, which allows us to have a full Torah reading. It allows us to have repetition of the Amidah um, and all of the things that we haven't had up until now on Zoom. Um, and on the flip side of that, we do feel that having about a dozen people in a room the size of our sanctuary um, can be done with the utmost care in terms of masks and social distancing. And, um, you know, just to give one illustrative example. Um, we've all heard that we're supposed to maintain six feet difference. Um, and that's true until you have a singer leading a service and then you need a 30 foot distance, right? And so if you can imagine where Rabbi Yosef would stand at the high holidays facing the congregation, um, right away you can take four, maybe five rows and just cordon them off, right? Um, and, and that starts to play out throughout the room. Uh, and since Pikuach uh, Nefesh, since, since uh, health and safety is our first responsibility in all of this, we are moving forward with the online paradigm. Um, and the people who will be present in the room are going to be, uh, you know, Bali Tefillah service leaders, Torah readers, Haftarah readers, um, and again, uh, you know, as we're thinking about all of this, since we're hearing that there's some elevated risk in cycling people through the same spaces, uh, we're actually, when we start recruiting these teams, going to be looking for the same team of people for both days of Rosh Hashanah, because that's going to allow us to maintain the lowest possible risk profile. The same people are going to be there the first day, the second day. The same people will be at Kol Nidre that will be at Yom Kippur Day. Uh, so that we can really manage risk and make sure that the few people that we are bringing in for leadership of the service are going to be, uh, that they are going to be safe and that we're going to keep everybody safe. Um, we are also exploring the possibility of using outdoor spaces for smaller gatherings. Um, the biggest halachic hurdle that we have um, is that we can't do, we can't halachically fulfill the mitzvah of shofar blowing over Zoom. Um, and so right now, what we are exploring, again, with the advice of medical professionals, would be how to have a number of neighborhood-based shofar blowings where smaller groups of people could gather, uh, could be socially distanced, um, and, you know, welcome to 
2020 and to COVID-19 um, to use a shofar with a piece of cloth or a mask rubber banded around the end of it uh, because the shofar itself is a potential risk factor. Um, there'll be a lot of details coming out as we get closer to the high holidays, um, but mostly wanted to illustrate um, that we're thinking about both virtual and in-person paradigms um, and how are we going to be able to do each of those things in the safest possible way. Um, and in terms of the service itself, the um, in terms of the service itself, really having this priority around the kinds of interactivity and community relating that we've already heard around Shabbat services and weekday minion have been so important to people. Um, so we will have the capacity for people to be called to Aliyot from their homes via Zoom into the sanctuary as a part of the Torah reading. Um, we're exploring all kinds of ways for congregants to be actively involved in the service um, so that wherever you are at home, as Rabbi Annie always reminds us, it's really important to sing your heart out. Um, and we want there to be a sense of active participation. Um, we don't want this to be uh, Rosh Hashanah the movie that everyone's sitting at home watching. Um, and so already the task force has uh, taken that on as a priority and something that we're hoping to hear from people tonight is what are the most important touch points? Where are the places that you want to have that kind of interactivity? Um, and finally, we're, we're putting even a larger spin on something that we've done in past years, which is to think about the five weeks from Rosh Chodesh Elul through Yom Kippur as a single arc of high holiday experience. Um, and so you're gonna start seeing even in late August already, uh, BZBI gearing up for the high holidays. Um, again, using virtual, um, using socially distanced outdoor opportunities, using independent self-study materials and things that you can form your own pods of people to connect with so that um, what we're hoping you will experience is a long arc of Yamim Noraim and not two episodes on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur that are independent and isolated, um, but really hoping as best we can to create a unified experience. Um, and I'll close just by repeating um, some of my remarks from the annual meeting. Um, one of the things that I'm so proud of BZBI as a community is the way that we have all learned in this time of quarantine and social distancing um, to be present for each other while being distant. And it's that, it's that tension, it's that paradox of present and distant that we're going to bring to you at the High Holidays as well. Um, we'll all be in lots of different homes and we are going to be together and we're going to be BZBI. Um, and I'm gonna turn it back to Sheila now to share some of the, uh, the values that the task force identified earlier this week as underpinning our work. Thank you, Rabbi Abe. Um, Rabbi Abe has um, you know, touched on um, uh, some of what we, we discussed in the task force, um, you know, given the, you know, the feelings of loss and anxiety that, that many of us have about uh, what services will be like, uh, we also want to see this as an opportunity and start at a place where we're very aware of what's really most important to us. And so we asked each other at the task force, what are the qualities, uh, uh, the moments in a service, um, the aspects of the service that, that really make it the most, um, most meaningful and satisfying, inspiring um, to each of us? Um, it probably won't surprise you that um, many of the things that were said at the task force had to do with community, with the, the feeling of community. Um, I think the first comment that was made was, 
that such an important part of this of high holiday services is the a feeling that people are held and engaged um, by the service. And people expressed the, the value of opportunities for participation by a range of individual congregants. Um, not surprisingly, um, communal singing, community singing, those moments when all the voices come together and rise um, um, and familiar melodies. Um, so that's, those are important values and challenges that we'll face doing this online. And as we've said, we, we have met those challenges in, in other ways and um, we're gonna work on how to do that uh, for the high holidays. Um, a group within our task force will be uh, focusing especially on that. Other values uh, that, that the group um, brought, brought out were um, a service that doesn't feel like a stage setting, um, which I, I think we, we all appreciate. Um, a service that has opportunities for contemplation and encourages contemplation. A service that has energetic pacing and a sense of flow. A service with good timing, not too short, not too long. Right? Uh, and we'll be keeping the, those, um, <laughs> that, that spectrum in mind. We'll be looking for that perfect timing. Um, uh, as, as we go into get into the planning. Uh, the, a service with, with evocative high holiday imagery, which we'll all want to see, even though we're not in the sanctuary, um, the white flowers, the open arc, et, et cetera. Uh, and of course, people mentioned key liturgical moments, um, uh, such as Avinu Malkeinu, Natana Tokev, um, so, um, it's a, a good list uh, for us to begin with as, as a task force. It's also not a definitive list, and it's not definitive because it doesn't yet have all the input we need. We need your input, and that's uh, the most important reason we're, we're here today, to uh, share the information and to receive uh, your input. input. So. Uh, we want to open up a discussion and inviting you to, to please share what qualities or, or moments are most important to you. What are your concerns, your priorities, your hopes as, um, as you look to the, towards the experience of uh, high, high holiday services online this year? If, if the values that we've identified resonate for you, let us know. If they don't, let us know. If we missed something, let us know. Um, so we invite you then um, to share and um, let us know who, who would like to begin. Um, I'm going to moderate the yes. yeah. I'm mm -hmm. going to moderate the question and answers. So if you um, look, you should see at the bottom of the screen somewhere a raise hand um, button that allows you to raise your hand, or you can um, just uh, flat put in the chat box that you'd like to ask a question, and I'm happy to call on you. No, not raise your hand. I don't have a. I don't have a raise. Uh, Doug uh, yeah. Barg, um, before you ask your question, if you could help people find where the raise hand button is. It, it, it's okay. in participants, Abe. If they go into participants, there's on the bottom of that, one of them oh, is uh, okay. hand raise. Great, thank you. Where? All right, Doug, you're up. Which one of these? Is that it? First of all, I, I, I it's, like it's the button that says more. Right there, the blue thing. I'd, I'd, I'd like to congratulate the, the work that's already been done. I mean, 
it sounds like you guys have really gotten us off to a running start, and it's it's, it's very exciting, and very encouraging. Um, because of the situation we're dealing with, a lot of uh, never before experienced limitations. But it, it it occurs to me that we're also um, because of the situation, because of the technology, facing some some brand new opportunities, and I would hope. And as you think about the the form and substance of the uh, of the service, you'll look for ways to leverage the unique technology that we're going to be using, and see how we can use that in ways that are appropriate to enhance our experience. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Gary and Marianne. Okay. Um, I think number one, I'm torn between being a doctor and wanting to participate is, I think people would appreciate if we got, though we didn't have many people at any one time, we had a large number of different people during the day. But that changes the dynamic. But, that, but how we can yeah. do that medically is we have to think about it. I disagree with him there. Okay. And the other thing is when we have an opening, having a number of possible um, discussions at the same time so that people can be participating in the afternoon of Yom Kippur, for instance, and have a choice of different people or groups to discuss things with. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, Gary. Um, I guess it bears saying that at, in general, we are planning to offer some kind of alternative worship programming as we have uh, offered in person in the past. And um, the, you know, we don't have exactly what that's going to be lined up, but um, you know, as we think about BZBI's High Holiday Experience, uh, we are thinking about the discussions and the alternate programming as well as the, um, the core service, if we think about it that way. Um, Joshua Rosenberg asked a question in the chat box about the choreography for the Torah service, uh, whether we're going to be using one reader for the whole service, who's going to be doing Hagwe and Galila, where the Gabayim going to be, and so on. Um, not all of that is worked out, um, but there is going to be uh, social distancing and proper uh, protections and things, um, just to give a couple of concrete examples so people know what we're talking about. Um, we've been talking about the possibility of um, having clear table covers and having each uh, service leader or Torah reader who comes up to a shtender to cover the, uh, cover the table themselves and then take the cover with them when they leave. Um, we've definitely been talking about having the gabayim further away, uh, following the Torah reading and giving corrections, but not right there next to the Torah reader. Um, we just, we don't have specific answers um, for all of those questions yet because we've only begun the work. Uh, but as I said before, the first commitment is going to be to health and safety. Um, and so the first commitment is going to be to maintaining social distancing, even if that means that we then end up doing the choreography uh, very differently. The first priority is going to be for us to uh, just maintain the proper safety protocols. Uh, we're going to go to Rena and Stanley Field next. Uh, I just have a minor technical problem. How are we going to know? How are we going to get prayer books? How are we going to know the service? Ah, that's what I forgot to mention earlier. Um, the office has already worked out a procedure um, for lending or selling machzorim, um, and that will depend. We've heard from people that some people would rather simply uh, purchase their own copy of the machzor rather than. Uh, borrow one from the synagogue. Other people would rather borrow one for the the week of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and return it. Um, there will be details coming out later in the summer about exactly how you will do that, but the plans are already in place. Um, there will be a plan for getting the Book of Remembrance to people. Um, again, like I don't know. I, I, it may be in virtual form rather than a hard copy this year, but um, we will have all of the materials that you would imagine you would want to have for a meaningful high holiday service 
will be available for you, um, and there will be specific details coming later. Um, and Esta's asking about an online mahser. Um, Esta, I haven't seen any information yet about an online mahser. The, um, the rabbinical assembly has so far made available copies of all of their chumashim and sidurim for Shabbat and holiday use. Um, so I would not be surprised if we see an online mahser uh, become available as well. But I don't have, I, I just, I simply haven't seen from them any information about what that will look like and when that will become available. I'm um, going to go to Debbie Zelnick. Hi, everybody. David and I are um, both here listening, and it sounds like the committee has done a really great job thinking about um, things that we need to put in place. I would suggest the universities have really been doing a lot of work since March. Um, first, when it was just an emergency to get students home and get them online, but since then a lot of planning has been done, thinking about how to get large groups into small rooms, the best way to reach people remotely, um, and have people feel involved and very connected. So I would suggest that the committee might want to reach out and see what some of the universities have done that has worked. And then just one other thought to not make assumptions that everybody has um, an internet connection. And since we have a lot of time to think about this before September, to just make sure that everybody who is in the congregation has a good internet, or maybe we can help those that might not have it um, to get some kind of access. Yeah, so we, um, we have made available for all of our Zoom services telephone dial-in that um, any telephone can do. You know, you don't need a smartphone, you can do it. I mean, literally, you could stand on the corner with a payphone and a stack of quarters if that was your thing. Um, and so, um, and we know that there are people who are regularly participating in our weekday and Shabbat services who are using the telephone dial-in, and we will make sure that that is um, also available. Um, we also, the task force discussed this week, um, uh, some of you participated with David Haas um, earlier in the COVID period with uh, some kind of Zoom orientation sessions, helping people get comfortable with the technology, helping people connect, and we'll be offering a new round of those toward the end of the summer with the high holidays specifically in mind to make sure that people who have concerns about access and connection are able to get connected in that way. Um, um, and Debbie, in terms of the stuff that's coming out of universities, if it's all right with you, can we have somebody from the task force follow up with you to maybe get some specific pointers of where to look? Sure, that'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Uh, we're going next to Lori Siegel. Hi. Um, I had one question and two comments. You may have already kind of addressed this one, which was um, when you were talking about diverse groups. One thing that um, I really have enjoyed in, are the discussion groups that, that uh, and the small group sessions on um, Yom Kippur. So it sounds like you're, you're planning to somehow fit those in. Um, I was wondering also about children's services, though I don't have, I have very much grown children. Um, how were you factoring that in as well? And shall I give my other two points at this point? Um, let me just say about the youth and family services um, are being addressed by Rabbi Max Nissen, who's our director of youth and family education. Um, that's like a whole separate track and a whole separate conversation. And we're we're working hard to meet the needs of our youth and families at the same time that we're working to meet the needs of the general congregation. Uh, tonight's conversation was really envisioned as being about the adult facing uh, high holiday program. Ah, okay, great. Well, I'm glad to hear they're, they're both happening at the same time. Um, then my other question is, uh, or comment is that, um, I don't know if technologically, there is a way to have something online. So it sounds like you're part of the group. One of the things, of course, with Zoom is that you can't hear everybody in unison. And I know that you did mention that um, as being something that you know, people value. Um, and so 
I wondered, is that possible? Do you know? Is there a way to find out about that? Uh, so the, and my last point was, yeah. it's going to be limited just to members because I see it as a value, a valuable way to introduce BZBI to other people at no cost, so to speak. Yeah, so um, I think, you know, at, we haven't made decisions about where's, how much access there's going to be available to people beyond our membership. Um, I think, you know, both for, in terms of thinking about prioritizing the experience of our membership first, um, and also in terms of some very real concerns about Zoom security, I think the full interactivity of Zoom really will be reserved for our membership. Um, it is possible that we may offer a one-way stream, real-time stream of the service that would be accessible beyond our membership. Um, but the, the fully interactive Zoom will probably be limited to our registered membership. Um, in terms of the, the online singing together, um, you know, the answer to your question is in theory, yes, and in practice, no. Um, there, as somebody, I was forwarded from a rabbi a sheet that said, you know, here's the instructions to be able to get people to sing in unison on Zoom. Um, and somewhere around the top of page three of five, I said to myself, the chances of our being able to get our entire congregation to follow all of these instructions on their individual devices, um, you know, is not, I mean, you know, you, you really have to go into like the master user settings that I don't even know where they are. And I think it's just a limitation we're going to have to live with. Um. And I think Yosef and I have also been thinking about some creative ideas for, for the music, whether it's recording voices of congregants in advance, finding ways to um, incorporate that, and also sharing out music um, in advance for, for folks to, to prepare. Um, so we're definitely thinking of creative ways to help engage people in the singing. And yes, it is, it is a hard uh, thing, to, as Rebbe at a loss right now to live with not being able to sing together gathered in person but we're going to do what we can to make the music um amazing and engaging and, and participatory um i'm going to go now to ed kerson um ed I'd, if you could ask your question that you put in the chat box because i think it would be helpful for others and also if you could just clarify a little bit exactly what you're talking about uh, but you have to unmute for us to hear you Uh, yeah, okay. The question is, what has been the thinking or discussion up to this point regarding the place in the community going forward uh, of those who are, uh, you know, unable, unwilling, whatever you want to say, um, uh, to utilize electronic equipment on holidays and Shabbat? Um, I, my understanding from, you know, the best that I've heard from, you know, the smartest doctors that I know is that, you know, until and unless there's a vaccine that's safe and that is pretty effective, uh, this is going to be with us for quite a while. So uh, this is not something that's going to be over anytime very soon. And uh, that being the case, uh, the paradigm of, uh, you know, essentially shutting down, um, you know, a minion in a traditional sense and going to kind of an electronic minion, you know, has some consequences for people who aren't comfortable, you know, doing that. Um, and the question is, what's the thinking on that subject? Uh, yeah, I, you know, and this was, um, I spoke about this, I can't remember where now, I've spoken about this a lot. Um, I, this was something that was an immense personal struggle for me, uh, because BZBI's Shabbat service uh, that started at the beginning of last month was the first time in, I think, 25 years that I had used an electronic device on Shabbat. Um, and, and it was a big struggle to kind of wrap around that. I think, Ed, I would encourage you to reach out uh, to me or to Rabbi Annie to just kind of have mm -hmm. a, a really a personal conversation about observance. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
because I, I think you're right that it's going to be a very long time before we're back to running Minyanim the way we used to. And even once that comes back around, we may still be seeing periodic shutdowns again. Um, I just think it's it's really hard to address those converse, those questions in a in a group setting versus in a one on one conversation with a rabbi. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage you and anyone else who has questions about this, whether it's about the high holidays or about Shabbat in general, uh, to reach out to one of us to follow those questions up. Great. All right, thank you. Um, going to Bonnie Nierman. All right, Bonnie, uh, yeah, go for it, Bonnie. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm not sure if you can see me, but you can hear me. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, but not see you. Okay, well, uh, what I have to say is more important than, than seeing me. Um, I, this is a wonderful conversation, and it got me to think. Um, one of my young friends is um, a student and undergraduate at Drexel University, and the universe, because of um, the pandemic, the university has been struggling with internships for their students. So, and listening to some of the discussion tonight, I'm thinking that a wonderful internship, perhaps a joint internship with a student from their communications or their film studies or their school of public health, or maybe the three students together could be very helpful in helping to help us visualize um, the service and be inclusive and bring a set of fresh outside eyes to um, the technology that we're going to be using, putting uh, forward here. And there, the University of Drexel and, and is struggling to, um, to um, place um, students in, um, m most of their internships, I believe, are unpaid. Many of them are unpaid, but it would be a wonderful experience for them. Uh, that sounds really exciting. Thank you, Bonnie. It's very exciting, and I think it'll be very exciting for, for the students. Um, and I, I mean, I would be happy to help um, connect uh, in, in any way that I could. Um, it, it, I, I think it could be very meaningful in terms of helping all of us um, who are on Zoom feel part of a larger um, community at feel like we perhaps like like we would feel if we were sitting in the sanctuary thank you you can i'll follow up with you <laughs> uh, well, so bonnie i think i think we'll have someone from the task force will reach out to you will be the best okay. way to do it okay all right thank you Um, I just saw um, Tamar Fox that you wanted uh, clarification on something. Do you want to just pop in and ask for clarification on whatever that was? I'm trying to yeah, I don't. List here. I don't really understand the um, the response to Ed's question about how we're going to include people who aren't comfortable using electronics on Shabbat or Chag. It sounds like you think that that's a personal conversation about convincing people to do that or feel comfortable with that? And I want to hear a little bit more about that. Okay, thank you. I, I don't at all want to convince anyone of anything. Um, I think that our, our hands are a little bit tied in the sense that if we're going to be conscientious about the public health guidance that we're receiving, we can't be then bringing large numbers of people into the sanctuary. I think it, you know, as we're thinking about assembling this sort of smaller crew of people who are going to be present to constitute the minion and to run the services, I think within the bounds of kind of what we need in terms of participation and leading the services and so on, um, you know, Rabbi Annie and I would be happy to prioritize first place in that crew going to people who really need the in-person presence because the, they're not going to be comfortable logging on online. I think part of the personal conversation is there are, there are a lot of different ways to link in some that may be more comfortable for people. Um, but again, I don't want to convince anyone to do anything that they're not comfortable with. Um, but we also can't open the doors to large numbers of people to come into the synagogue. Um, so I think, you know, when we start to think about 
how are we assembling the 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 functional minion that's going to be at the synagogue we would certainly want to be able to offer spaces to people you know on a need base for those people who are not going to be able because of their personal observance to take advantage of the online services to then to the best of our ability include them in constituting that minion at bzbi um, and also wanted to to add in that um beyond the services we want to think of ways to connect people to each other so perhaps if there are people who might want to meet up in a you know a safe outdoor way um you know with masters to, to get together you know can we help facilitate that as well um we want to be cr creating materials for people to do study perhaps um to come together, you know, again, during the month of, of Elul and Aser Yimei Tshuva, um, to come together to, to study, to do things, you know, in the spirit of the day. But we definitely want to keep the conversation open because we know that we have um, a community where people have diverse practices and, and we want to support um, everyone in, in figuring out a way to have as meaningful high holidays as, as possible and be considering the whole community, you know, as, as we're planning um, different experiences in addition to the services as well. Yeah. Thank you, Rabbi Annie. Um, Jan Weinstock had a question about outdoor gatherings. Um, Jan, I don't have a lot of details because the planning has just started. I think the two um, kind of the two obvious examples that come to mind are um, Tashlich, which would be done outdoors anyway. Um, and shofar blowing, where we do have a halachic impediment that we can't fulfill the mitzvah of shofar via Zoom. Um, so those are the two that can put themselves on the docket. And um, I can't speak to what else might potentially be out there. Um, you know, I, I, what I would say is um, Sheila put her email address in the chat earlier, and I'm going to ask Sheila to um, put her email in the chat box again now. Um, if you've got specific thoughts about ways to use uh, safe, socially distanced outdoor settings for the high holidays, uh, go ahead and email Sheila so that we can feed that into the task force work. I'm going to go next to Iris Siegel. Okay, thank you. I'm glad to, to join in this discussion tonight. I've I just been writing down several ideas, um, so, and they're somewhat at random. But, so, okay, so let me start. I al already heard that there will not be a choir engaged for this uh, uh, upcoming holiday. But I will mention, uh, I know from a friend part of, who's part of Singing City, they pulled together and, and the individual singers file their individual singing parts and it's all meshed, all blended together to present something. So to the extent that there might be some consideration of using talent to create the singing environment um, that may be something we might need to reevaluate. Re uh, but having said that, if there's not going to be a choir, then would we still be holding the two separate services, in essence, in the sanctuary and the Kahaner Auditorium? Um, is there any segments of the services that could be pre-recorded, like a week uh, before, like a sermon or, or the president's message and so forth, without bringing everybody into it, the sanctuary to be part of, of the live uh, feed. Uh, and that also goes for, you know, the Torah readers or the Haftorah readers. Uh, you know, some of us might not be able to make it to the, uh, to be able to participate, you know, in the service as we have done for, you know, more than 50 years. Okay, uh, it, it is one day of a chauffeur uh, blowing. So, uh, and again, I, I can tell from the experience where I, I wrangle all the uh, the, the ballet uh, to, to Kyoto, uh, we may only have about a, a dozen uh, at best uh, you know, chauffeur blowers. So that, that limits how many perhaps neighborhoods or, you know, that we could have our outreach and that's that's an issue um but actually last uh, shabbat elkin and i were attending uh, on zoom a service in new york and all of a sudden they were you know the chauffeur services dear to me 
so but someone had uh, the rabbi there was just thanking someone for conducting the show for blowing class so i immediately asked well what are your plans for the high holidays well you know it's almost like uh we'll zoom it in one way or another and i said but what about the issue of having someone call out the notes and then the then the, the baltakia blows the notes He's, so he was saying there's no requirement that the notes be called out. So I don't know whether you uh, f feel that's appropriate or not. And just, uh, again, the choreography, what are you folks going to be able to do for Elenu in the Musaf service where you would be bowed out and there's a number of uh, uh, Gaboyim picking you up because that's not the social distancing that's required. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Uh, looks like Doug, is that, uh, we're going to go back to Doug Barg. Hi. Um, this, this may be totally from left field, but I'm, I'm hearing a number of different themes. Um, one, one of them is, is this notion that you'd like to make this a month long um, trajectory of, of experience uh, consummating in, in, in Yom Kippur, obviously, um, which I think is wonderful. Um, another, another thing is that clearly a lot of what we're going through is, is conditioned on the, on the restrictions and, and uh, realities of dealing with COVID-19. But that's that's not the only social theme that we're confronting um, in in our culture today, in in, in our society, and, and in our neighborhood. Um, it, it it seems to me that the that the theme of tshuva may offer a really interesting opportunity, particularly given that we don't have any space constraints in how and who we interact with at this time. And I'm just wondering if there is a potential here for outreach to other faith communities, other ethnic communities, um, to integrate them somehow, if not into services per se, but certainly uh, looking at a different aspect of tshuva um, as, we, as we approach thy holidays. Thank you, Doug. Um, looking to see, I don't see hands raised. Are there, are there any other questions that people uh, still have that you want to raise, weigh in on? And I am going to turn things over to. One more. Oh, One more oh, we do have yes, David, David I Haas. Um, yeah, hi. Gotcha. Hi. Uh, so I, I just sent you, and I had sent to Elkin a, a question, and I I didn't get an answer, but I thought maybe other people would be. Yeah. Thinking I was of, working uh, on an answer, but why don't you go ahead and ask <laughs> now? Because I think this will be yeah. helpful for everyone. Right. So so I think the 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 difficulty with. Um, the virtual environment for services is there's there is sort of an, a, a very different sense of decorum if there's any at all and um, certainly there is an informality between even an in-person daily minyan and and uh, even uh, Saturday morning services or whatever but during high holidays there is a, a heightened sense of decorum that is always part of the experience. And I think some thought has to be given to how in a Zoom world, we can make sure that that is maintained and respected by participants. Um, I've already sort of voiced some concerns to some about how some people participate in Minyanim where they're 
you know, on a phone, their iPhone, they don't turn their video off, they're roaming around the house, they're roaming outside, they're riding a bus. All these things are very distracting to the other people who are seeing this on their screen and trying to have a, a meaningful experience. So I think that either through a combination of expectations that might be announced and, and possibly controls that are imposed by the hosts on the Zoom call, we might be able to avoid that. But there, it's more than I'm, I'm sure others could think of, but that, that was a concern for me. Yeah, I mean, I think there are there are three main pathways um, to address this, and I'm I'm going to kind of strongly suggest that we employ all of them. I mean, one is to simply communicate uh, expectations and norms. Um, if you were at um, if you were at Jordan Stahlbaum's bat mitzvah a few Shabbatot ago, um, we spent we we put a lot of thought into how we were going to articulate to people um, because it was a service where we had a lot of people who were not regularly going to Zoom services so didn't know things about staying on mute and about when we unmute for Kaddish being aware of the noise that might be in the background of their space and remuting and all of those kinds of things. So uh, we are definitely going to be um, to be setting out some very clear expectations about what you know, whether you want to call it uh, decorum or norms for participation, um, not only in terms of what we would like people not to do, but also in terms of what we would like people to do. As you know, as Rabbi Annie is always encouraging us to sing, and you can look on gallery view and you can see people singing along. And even if you don't hear them, um, I know for me, like I, I do get a sense of, you know, I hear Rabbi Annie, but I see five other people's lips moving and I do have a sense of togetherness. That's one thing. Um, I think we are going to be a little bit stricter with centralizing the controls um, so that uh, it will hopefully not be possible for people to choose to unmute themselves, uh, but will be possible for us to unmute people who are taking all the yod or leading prayers or doing any of those kinds of participatory things. Um, because it's, you know, on a minion, on a Shabbat service with 35 people, you can see who's making noise and mute them. If we're imagining three or 400 people might be on Zoom for the high holidays, that's a very different proposition. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the last piece is, um, and this comes back to thinking about Zoom tutorials, uh, Zoom gives us a lot of control over our own experience and gallery view isn't the only way to experience the service, um, you know, and so it is, possible to pin video on whoever is leading the service and to see only them and then whatever's happening on other people's screens um, you know in the same way that I've uh, I've sometimes suggested to people that if they find there's too much milling about in the aisles they could simply sit closer to the front and then all that milling about will happen behind them um, on, there's a part of me that feels like these problems of distracting movement and distracting noise are not actually new problems for a synagogue service I see by some of your faces that you are agreeing with me on that. Um, but there are different ways that we need to deal with them because our, our interface with the service is different through Zoom than our interface would be through uh, being in person. Um, and I think all three of those things, we're gonna communicate norms, we're gonna do what we can to maintain a really tight control over the participation. Um, and, you know, part of the, the information that we're going to send out is going to be to help people know how to pin video if you just want to see Rabbi Yosef, um, to be able to pin video on Rabbi Yosef or on whoever's leading the service or on the Torah reader or, um, you know, how, however you want to do that to be able to um, really create that focus and that kavanah, while we are also encouraging people who are making breakfast to turn their video off, right? It, you know, it's a, it's right. a, a both sides proposition. And you almost need to see if there are, since there's not much sports going on, perhaps you could find someone who's a director from one of the sports networks to be the director of the service. So you could see different views of different things. And at oh, the so same that's time, something, um, that's something I, we didn't, that's something we didn't say, but uh, we have actually installed three separate cameras in the sanctuary. Okay. Um, and we will be, the who's going to be doing it and how it's going to be done is still an open question, but um, we, we have separate cameras so that we're able to give clear, close views of where any of the rabbis might be to be able to give a view of the ark. Um, and when we figured out exactly how we're going to set the room, 
Um, part of what you'll see in August, for those of you who are participating in the Shabbat uh, morning services, will be one of the rabbis will be starting to be in the sanctuary so that we can field test the cameras and connections in the sanctuary, even while we're still doing our Zoom from home kind of a paradigm for services, um, one of the rabbis will be at the synagogue so that we can work out um, and just you know make sure that, because um, I'm sure you won't be surprised to find out that we don't want Rosh Hashanah day one to be the day that we find out if the equipment works. Right. I mean, one thing that's a, a very, um, I've, I've been to on Zoom, some of these, um, you know, or even on, on uh, YouTube, um, you know, streaming services, and they're they're very very they're they're dull because you just see one view, mm -hmm. it, it, and you're distant, and and nothing changes, and you you pay attention, you listen, you can hear it, but it's it's odd. There's really not a sense of being there. Um, you you feel more present in the experience of a service when you actually see the people closer, see reactions, or whatever. So. The yeah. idea of having multiple cameras is a great idea. Yeah, and here I want to single out our communications coordinator, David Haas, who's put a lot of thought and hardware into um, figuring out how we're going to achieve exactly that. Because I think we all, I mean, uh, David and Rabbi Annie and I, the first time we imagined that we might have high holidays online said, the last thing we want is a view of 40 empty pews with a mini rabbi at the far end of it. Right. Um, and so, um, so we'll be able to be uh, to offer some really close views and hopefully a really dynamic experience for the people who are on Zoom. Thank you, right, Rabbi Annie. Thank you all so much for your questions and ideas and resources and um, responses. Um, this has been a really generative opportunity to, to brainstorm and share together. I just want to lift up a few of the themes that I heard throughout the course of our discussion and then turn it back over to, to Sheila to close our time together and let us know about some next steps. Um, so I heard uh, a commitment um, among so many in our community to, to, to ask this question of how can we make the experience accessible for all of the members of our community who have different needs and whether that's access to internet, to computers, um, whether that's considering folks different um, practices and relationships to, to um, halakha and, and comfort with using the online service. Um, we talked about how making sure that everyone will have the materials that, that you need to engage fully in high holidays, getting a matzor at home, a book of remembrance, um, we talked about offering trainings for Zoom um, and and one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you know, um, and group opportunities to help folks become um, as comfortable as possible for those who are, are going to be using um, the technology and joining us by Zoom. Questions came up about logistics and how do we do some of our beloved uh, rituals um, in this era of social distancing safely? Um, what might a Torah service look like, right? some different questions about that. Um, folks shared wonderful resources, um, whether it's universities who have had to adapt and evolve in, in this time to think about how to make um, learning experience most engaging online, um, and as, as well as university students who may be able to help us um, with, with um, creating resources. We talked about music and how it's a loss to not be able to be together singing in community and some of the other ways we might be able to um, make meaningful, joyful music um, from our homes um, together. Um, so those are, are a few of the, the themes that came up and also this idea of the whole season of the high holidays and the experiences beyond the service. I'm lifting up this idea of tshuva, which is, is the work of the season as we started with this song, Hashibeni, right? We're, we're invited to um, return to our, our best selves to do the work of, of repairing relationships. And what does that look like in this moment in our country? How might we as a community, and we've been involved and are continuing to deepen our involvement in, in racial justice work and um, partnering with communities of other faiths and how might we 
um, do this work of tshuva together throughout the season of the high holidays and what might that look like to, to engage with our neighbors beyond our shul. Um, and what are the opportunities? What are the unique opportunities? As there are limitations and losses, there are also incredible opportunities and in how can we, if we leverage technology, um, find ways of gathering safely outdoors and make the most of this opportunity, as Rabbi Abe mentioned at the beginning, to connect more, more deeply with one another, with the, the meaning of the high holiday season, um, with the holy. Um, and with the things that give us life and help us to continue <laughs> with courage um, through, through these times. So again, thank you all for, for bringing yourselves here, for listening with one another, to one another, to sharing um, your um, very important questions and ideas. I'm gonna turn it over to Sheila to let us know how we can continue as a community this conversation. <laughs> I also want to thank everyone, especially uh, Rabbi Annie, Rabbi Abe, and uh, the task force. Um, thanks to all of you for for all the for being for participating in this meeting and for for sharing so so many um, wonderful ideas, concerns uh, for all the energy that that you bring to these possibilities. Um, I want to let you know that um, the task force will continue to meet. We'll be meeting just about weekly uh, through August, including uh, small teams that will be working on the technology and considering um, the many suggestions that you've offered. There's a small group that will be focusing on aspects of the service itself, the liturgy, the Torah readings, um, et cetera. And uh, another group uh, that will be focusing on many possibilities for community participation. And thank you for the, the ideas that you've shared in that area as well. Uh, we plan to have another town hall about the high holidays uh, early in August uh, to uh, keep you updated and get more feedback and have more discussion at any time you are welcome, encouraged to share your questions and ideas. Um, and it would be helpful if you send them to me at the address that I've put in the chat box. Thank you again, everyone. Erev Tov, have a good Shabbat and a safe holiday weekend. And I do want to remind everyone that Mari was at 8.30 tonight. I wanted to remind them too. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I thought you were done. Thank you. <laughs> I was. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you all so much. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. You. No, yeah, okay. Go on. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Good song at the beginning. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Did you compose that with your husband? Yes. Yeah, yes. Very nice. We're going to work on music all summer long and we're going to share some of it with you. So. Good. <laughs> Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.